Welcome to another episode of the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series. And this is a continuation of part one of Divorce Wars. And listen, before we get into this, um, if you're going through a situation or someone you know is where a marriage potentially is coming to its end, my heart goes out to you. And my goal for this is having gone through this experience in 2001, having coached many other people uh, through the experience as well, to share some of their stories. And today is a particularly horrifying story, but it's important that you hear it because first of all, I want to say, if your gut is telling you you're still within the marriage and your gut is telling you that things are moving in the direction of a separation or a divorce, and there are things happening behind your back that trigger that spidey sense. Um, Gavin DeBecker wrote an excellent book called The Gift of Fear. And it teaches that we have a hardwired primal instinct to pick up signs and cues in the environment, even if we don't recognize exactly why they bother us. The fact is that they do, and those need to be honored because it is that tingling on the back of your neck that leads you to not go down that dark alley, not, you know, take a walk in the middle of the night, not trust a stranger, pick up the phone and, you know, answer a call and be suspicious of it. It is that gut instinct that is inherent in us, that's hardwired in us, that protects us. So I want to call that out first. And second thing I want to say to you is please don't consider it paranoid to begin to save receipts and Jot down things in a diary for what you observe. Be prepared just in case. Protect yourself by keeping these in a safe space. Maybe you have a safe that you can place this in or somewhere private you can keep this information. And I'm going to tell you a story that will highlight exactly worst case scenario why this is important. And look, if you prepare for the worst and the worst doesn't happen, then everything above that is upside, right? So imagine this, husband and wife, and let me also preface by saying, this is a story about a husband and what he went through. That is not to suggest that a wife might do this to a husband. In fact, a husband might do this to a wife. So this has nothing to do with either spouse. This has to do with a scenario. So the husband knew that uh, the marriage was trending towards uh, potential divorce. And this is someone that I've known for a long, long time. I'm very, very close to. And I'd observed many things that caused us to have conversations. But unfortunately, we didn't see the signs of what was coming. Um, and that's why I'm sharing this story. So he knew that there were situations within the marriage that were concerning. And um, it came to a head one day when you know, he had a large property, five acre property and had children. And I won't get into names or, you know, boys or girls, whatever, doesn't matter for this story. And he'd been teaching them how to play softball, how to catch, how to pitch, how to hit, those types of things. And this particular day, he was on his property teaching baseball, teaching softball to his kids. And his ex-wife rolled up, soon to be ex-wife rolled up and said, I want to take the kids to town for a ice cream treat. And something triggered this husband that something's just not right in this situation. You know what? When she pulled away and he was watching the taillights, he said to himself, we've been arguing for a long time. This marriage is dysfunctional. He had been fighting to keep it. In fact, he said, maybe we could live as friends until the kids are old enough um, to, you know, kind of guide them through this so they're going to be okay once we separate and divorce. And his soon-to-be ex-wife was having none of that. So watching the taillights go up the driveway, he realized, you know what, this is probably the moment. And went into the house, wrote a very long note, and said, my corporate headquarters is out of town, um, as his wife knew, and I'm going to drive up to corporate. I have a meeting there anyways tomorrow. I was going to leave early in the morning. I'm going to leave now. And I'm going to stay in a hotel for a few days. I realized that we've reached that place where, you know, we should probably be talking separation. So when I come back, um, 
I want to sit down with you and let's figure out how we can best do this in order to start both of our new lives separately. Um, wrote the note, packed his bags, it's around 4.30 in the afternoon, drove two and a half hours up to his corporate headquarters, and while driving, called one of his friends that lived by corporate headquarters and said, hey, I really need a friend tonight. Any chance you can join me for dinner? So they met at 7 o'clock. Um, they had dinner. Dinner lasted a couple hours. Um, the husband paid for the dinner because he'd been the one that invited, and, you know, he had per diem with the company. Then checked into a hotel, stayed overnight, reported to work the next morning at 730 so here's what happened while he was gone. Unbeknownst to him, the wife had spent time in town going to different restaurants and shops, killing time. And about 6.30 or 7 that evening, reported to a battered woman shelter and claimed that she was physically thrown from the house along with the children. Let that sink in for a moment. The husband had been gone since 4.30. Couldn't have been home when this alleged incident occurred, she killed time until 6.30 or 7. Had the husband not had that gut instinct and been at home at the time, you know, he would have been vulnerable, to say the least, right? But checks into a battered woman shelter where people go because they are in legitimately a time of need and violated that service, that important community service, that's provided to people in those situations by making up a story. So what was the story about? In part one of this series, I talked about best interest of the child. And in many states, California included, um, the best interest of the child is considered to be shared parenting between parents, unless there is a mitigating circumstances, very specifically abuse, mental or physical abuse. So reporting to a battered woman shelter was to be the basis of forming an abuse claim. The husband returned from the business trip um, a few days later and found the house empty. A uh, day or so after that, received a call from a mutual family friend who said, if you want to know what's going on with your family, um, come over and I'll tell you. And when he arrived, he received a court filing that laid out this entire scenario in writing to the court. And of course, the first thing was he was shocked. The second thing was he was hurt. But along with this filing was a court recognition of a temporary restraining order preventing him from seeing his children. He could not call them. He could not see them. He could not go to their schools. And he knew that he'd been out of town, and he knew that this was fictitious but there was absolutely nothing he could do before appearing in the court. Um, admittedly, later, um, he said that it was naive on his part not to retain legal counsel. And let me be very clear. In the beginning phases of a divorce, you want to consider heavily retaining good legal counsel. Now, I talked in part one about the expenses associated. The eight minutes equals 15 minutes of billing time quarter hour, $270 per hour average for attorneys. There is no more important time than in the initial phases of divorce, especially if you suspect that your soon-to-be ex-spouse has an attorney as well. Um, but the husband showed up to court for the first hearing in pro se, which means by himself. Fortunately for him, he had literally had the receipts. So... Um, moving counsel who was representing the person who first filed, which was the wife in this uh, story, presented their case about being thrown from the home with the children and having no place to go, having to stay in a battered woman's shelter for a period of days um, because of what the husband had done. And when it came the husband's turn, of course, he presented receipts to say, my corporate headquarters is two and a half hours away. I arrived at a restaurant at 7 p.m., two and a half hours away. Here's the receipt. Here's the name of the friend that I had dinner with. Here's their cell phone number. You can ping towers and see that I called them from the car. 
here's the hotel I checked into, here's the HR contact at my company who will confirm that I reported to work the next morning at 7.30. And the entire basis initially the court saw through. But here's the thing, hearing this story, what do you think happened to the wife for making these egregiously horrible claims? You think maybe there was a sanction? You think maybe there was a warning? Maybe even some jail time for perjury? And as you might have guessed, the answer is absolutely not. Nothing happened whatsoever, except the court lifted the temporary restraining order. And this is what's called the initial hearing. And having good, sound legal counsel from the time that you first suspect there could be a divorce and you suspect that your soon-to-be ex-spouse might have retained legal counsel. From that point until the temporary hearings especially, it is critical to have good legal advice and good legal counsel. And as you get that counsel, to begin to understand how the family court system actually works can save you down the road a lot of heartache, headache, and yes, money. Because at the end of the day, the assets that you have as a family are now going to be divided. And what is most important is that they're divided in a way that allows both of you to start a new life. And in this particular case, the wife was solely focused on a paycheck. I want child support. I want alimony. I want to be set up for life. And I want, I don't care if my ex-husband lives in a cardboard box. I want everything and I want the kids and blah, blah, blah. And that was the motivation very clearly. And I'll continue this story um, of this friend of mine. I'll continue this story throughout the narrative into part three and beyond so you know exactly how things turned out. Um, recognizing that, at least in the state of California, alimony is divided into two timelines. The first is short cause, which is under 10 years. And that means that for half the term of the marriage, alimony applies. Child support, however, is based on earnings, as we talked about in part one. And there's a formula. You can go online and Google this and determine what that formula is. It is the amount of money each makes, and it's the amount of time that each has with the children. And there is a formula that they plug into a online spreadsheet. And this is called the basis. And the court has to be convinced to move off of that basis for very sound reasons, which are these abuse claims, amongst other things. Remember, too, that unsubstantiated claims, so in this husband's case, there had been no police reports. Even if there were witness statements on behalf of the wife, the court assumes that they could have been core statements. So they require actual, you know, verifiable entities like police departments, fire departments, incident reports uh, to substantiate claims. And fortunately for this husband, he had the receipts to prove he was out of town and there's no way this um, incident could have occurred. Lacking those receipts, having stayed home instead of having trusted his instincts, he would have been completely vulnerable in this situation with no way to disprove it. So I wanted to share this story because Number one, it's impactful. Number two, it's horrifying. And number three, it makes us all aware of the potential for things in a loving marriage to go south. And when they do, the motivations behind why people do the things they do can drive them to do some pretty horrible things. I want you all to be aware of the worst case scenario, which is this situation. And in the next episode, in part three, we're now going to talk about what happens between the initial hearing and temporary orders. I want to remind all of you that I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I am not an attorney. This is not meant to be legal advice. This is experiential and awareness raising. And I will share with you stories of um, folks that I've talked with over the years and helped in different situations solely with the goal of expanding your knowledge about all the potentials and all the things that can occur within this type of a situation so that you walk into it well-armed with the goal of doing what's right for your family 
as it starts its new life separately, being able to care for the children and care for yourself. Um, so I want to thank you for joining. My name is Philip Nacko. I'm a five-time published author and host of the Muddy Waters podcast and YouTube series. If you got something from this episode as horrifying as the story was, please do click the like button. If you know somebody, perhaps you or someone you care about who could potentially be going through this type of situation with a you know potential separation on the horizon, please do share this episode. Let's all be aware of the worst case scenario so that we can prepare to make it the very best for our family as we all start new lives together in a new journey. Thank you much, so much for tuning in. I hope you'll join me in a future episode.